The Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 749 for Monday, February 18th, 2019. To the Mac Observers, Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take all your questions, your tips, our tips, everything that really we can think of and cram it all into an hour ish, uh, sometimes a little more. With the goal being that every single one of us, you and me included, learns at least five new things every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include. Captera, captera.com slash MGG, hair club at hairclub.com slash MGG, and jamf now at jamf.com slash MGG. We will talk about all of those and spell the URLs for you shortly here, here in Durham, New Hampshire, where it's currently snowing. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fearful, Connecticut, where it's not snowing and yeah, it's above freezing. So, ah. Yes, it's, uh, it's pretty nice. Uh, this is John Braun. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, crazy for the weather, you know, but whatever. It's this time of year. It's how it goes. We, yeah, it's been weird. It's been snowing all day since before I woke up. And it wasn't until maybe an hour ago that it like started to actually accumulate. But now we've got like two inches on the ground. And I think that that'll be it. I think by the time we finish recording, the snow will have stopped. But, you know, whatever. It's pretty. It's all good. Yeah, uh, we got what they call the wintry mix but it wasn't a lot of it oh that's good and, yeah uh, that's the, that's worse than snow if you ask me but uh but i, I speaking of things coming down or downloads <laughs> as i like to say i was showing uh our esteemed editor-in-chief brian chaffin something this week that i do all the time and this is like the epitome of a quick tip and it it is because it's something i do all the time and didn't think to share with you folks or him until it came up Have you ever clicked on a link in Safari, like a video file or an audio file or something and or a picture even, and it loads and you can see it or hear it or watch it in your browser. But really what you wanted to do when you clicked on the link was download it. Right. And sometimes the link is such that you can't right click on it and download it. Like if you're just being brought there by, say, a link in an email or something. Well, here's the trick. You have to have downloaded something previously for this to work. And the reason I say that is otherwise the downloads drop down in the Safari menu doesn't appear. But once you have downloaded something and you can get that download thing to appear, the little drop down, click it, highlight any one of the things in the list. It doesn't matter which one you highlight. And as long as the URL to what you want to download is on your clipboard, you click you, you do command V, which is the shortcut for paste. It will paste this into the downloads window and begin downloading it immediately. So get the URL on your clipboard, open up the downloads window in Safari, paste it in and boom, down it comes right into your downloads folder, just like you would have wanted. Saves a lot of headache a lot of the time. So I, I wanted to share. Did you know about that one, John? Yes. Okay. And I see it. So... And yeah, so the icon for that is is a circle with a down arrow. Right. That's right. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Cool. I see it on Safari on one machine, but not on the other, because I don't think I've done a You haven't down. downloaded yet. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Coolio. All right. Which, uh, as as Jeff, listener Jeff reminds us, is uh, artist Leon Ivy Jr. Uh, so thank you, Jeff. Now on to Alan with uh, a quick tip about the large red circle. He notes that you can place the large red circle emoji at the beginning of a subject line in an email as an excellent way to get the recipient's attention. And I have to admit it works because, boy, did that thing stick out like a, well, a big red button in our uh, in our Mac Geek Gab email box at uh, at feedback at Mac Geek dot com where he sent it. And uh, did you say what, feedback at MacGeekab.com? I didn't quite hear you, Dave. Yeah, that's correct. That's and that's where Alan sent it. That's exactly right. Feedback at MacGeekab.com. And uh, and and he's right that you can insert any emoji into a subject line of an email. And as long as subject lines are are 
very much, you know, text only fields. You can't put HTML there. You can't do any styling of the text or anything. But emoji, at least on the Mac and iOS, works just fine there because it is treated by by those operating systems and those mail clients as part of the plain text alphabet, if you will, in at least in in so far as the subject line goes. So, yeah, you can put anything you want there. So it's a it's a handy little trick. Uh, as with everything, it is a tool. The tool in and of itself is neither good nor bad. How you choose to implement it, well, that may fall uh, under uh, future judgment. But uh, but there you go. So thanks for that, Alan. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are emails that I get that um, actually do that. Um, I'm just looking right now. So Flickr did one that had okay. symbols. Uh, Home Depot likes to put... Uh, Emojis in their uh, subject lines for their emails. There you go. I get on a regular basis, and even even Gazelle. So I just got one from Gazelle, and they have a little smiley face there. That's nice. And I'm going to add a bonus quick tip: <laughs> if you want to type an emoji on Mac OS, uh, Control Command Spacebar brings up Mac OS's emoji browser, which includes a search field. So if you wanted to find red circle. Uh, you can do that by typing red. For some reason, circle doesn't work, but uh, maybe hmm. button. I don't know. But if I type red, uh, there it is. It's 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 right there in all its, uh, well, red glory. So pretty cool. Thanks, Alan. Good stuff. All right. Greg has another tip, another thing that I use pretty regularly. He says, uh, have you ever wanted or needed to use the icon of an application perhaps in artwork for something else or in showing people we use it at mac observer all the time if we're doing you know uh, an article about a certain app we might include the app's artwork in uh, in a in amongst a, a image that we create or something for that uh, for that article and uh you can get the the high quality artwork of an application image by following greg's instructions Highlight the application in your applications folder in the finder, then go to the file menu, select get info or just do command I in the info window in the upper left, you will see the applications icon. Click on it and then from the edit menu, choose copy or do command C that puts actually a whole slew of icons. It puts the icon package, I think, on your clipboard and then you can go into preview and paste that or into whatever image editor you want. And paste that and boom, there you have it. You can resize it. It'll be the, the big Mondo image and you're good to go. So there you go. That's uh, another handy quick tip. This is why we do quick tips because it's super handy. Well, I'll give you another path. Though. So there is another way to do this, Dave. Okay. So this, I think, is the is the, the most direct. But um, if you have an application, here's, here's uh, what you can do. You right click on it. You say show package contents. You'll then see a contents folder. You're then going to see a number of folders within that. Open up the resources folder. You know what you're going to see there, Dave? You're going to see somewhere a .icns file, which is an icons file. Okay. Uh, that's another path to cool. um, get at that. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome. One last one for all of you who are keyboard maestro users. And if you are not, maybe this will be the thing that convinces you to start using it. Keyboard maestro is good for a lot of things. I say all the time, it's the future of automation on the Mac. Frankly, I think it's the present of automation on the Mac too, because you can do all kinds of great things with it. But, uh, but it can also, I use it as a secondary clipboard or a, cl sorry, a clipboard stack so that Everything I copy to my clipboard, uh, when I copy a new thing to my clipboard, the old thing doesn't get erased. Uh, it just moves down the stack and I can choose when I go to paste something, I can choose where, which item from my clipboard I want to paste, not just the most recent one, which is super handy. But uh, Lucas, as in the Lucas that I live with over at my house, uh, reminded me of something. He had a Google Doc that uh, actually is a lab partner of his was editing. And it was driving uh, his lab partner crazy because he was trying to uh, just format the text a little bit. But it had some baked in formatting that was making paragraphs automatically space a certain way. And no matter what he did inside of his Google Doc, he could not get this to go away. And Lucas is like, I know how to fix this. He said, share the document with me. So kid did. Lucas opened up his web browser. He highlighted the entirety of the text in this uh, this particular report, hit 
cut so as to remove it from the Google Doc. Then he used the shortcut that he had previously made in Keyboard Maestro that takes the clipboard and inserts text by typing. And you do that, and it is as though you typed it all in. Keyboard Maestro takes what's on the clipboard and types it in, which makes it inherit plain text or whatever the format is, does not paste in any of the formatting because it's just re literally retyping it. As far as the app's concerned, it was typed in, not pasted in. And sure enough, the formatting problems went away. So handy thing for keyboard maestro. And I, I have a, a keyboard shortcut that will do exactly that too. Um, because, because of how handy that is. It's super handy sometimes to be able to just strip formatting. So it is good stuff. Are you using keyboard maestro yet? My friend, Mr. Braun? Nope. Okay. Okay. Someday you will. Someday you might start also using Jamf Now, which is our first sponsor for this episode. Uh, Jamf is an awesome service that uses Apple's mobile device management that, to allow you to not only keep track of all the devices that you need to keep track of your Macs, your iPhones, your iPads, but also keep track of those from other people too, be it family members or people that you work with, or if you're a consultant, people that you support. Because while it's really easy to keep track of your own devices and manage your own settings, what happens when you're on the phone or somebody emails you and says, oh, my email settings got screwed up or this or that or the other thing? Well, Remotely, you can control all of that stuff using Jamf now. It makes it totally easy to set up, manage, protect. You can keep your digital inventory. You can distribute things like Wi-Fi or email settings, as I said. You can deploy apps remotely, enforce passcodes, protect company data. You can even lock or wipe a device as needed remotely from anywhere. And Jamf now helps you manage your devices so you can focus on your business instead. No IT experience needed. So it gets even better. Mac Geek Gab listeners can start securing their business today, you can do this and you get up to three devices for free at all times. That's pretty good. So yeah, what you're hearing is if you go to jamf.com slash MGG, that's J A M F dot com slash MGG. You can create your free account. You can add three devices to it for free. More devices you can add starting at just two bucks a month per device. But don't worry about that right now. Just go to jamf.com slash MGG, create your free account, add up to three devices. You're good to go. Our thanks to Jamf for sponsoring this episode with Jamf now. All right, John, I think it's time to talk about the uh, Wi-Fi industrial complex. And, <laughs> and by that, I mean, I know we talk. We talked a little bit because, well, I was going to call it big Wi-Fi, right? But I, that doesn't, uh, you know, that that doesn't that doesn't have quite the ring to it. So, so we'll call it the, the Wi-Fi industrial complex. <laughs> right before we recorded Mac Geek Gev 748 last week, we found out that Amazon had purchased Eero, and we talked about that very briefly in the show, but. Uh, We've gotten a lot of emails and texts and carrier pigeons and pretty much any way any of you could figure out how to get in touch with me. And of course, that's not that hard. Uh, you did. And you asked about it. So I figured, let's talk about it. Dan has a great setup for this. Very brief setup. He says, uh, I'm curious what you two think about this. He says, I... Uh, trust Amazon with my shopping, my digital content and standing behind my purchases, but I'm not sure how I feel about them owning my router and potentially being able to see every site I go to and not to spy on me. Am I being crazy? So, no, I don't think you're being crazy, Dan. Um, you know, it's one of those things, right? We talk all the time on this show about choosing our place right on that continuum between security and convenience. And it's also not a surprise that Eero was acquired. Uh, you know, as we said, I think we said this in the last show, I've talked a lot about this all week. So forgive me if I'm rehashing myself. But, you know, they were a VC funded company. 
an acquisition was an obvious exit for those VCs. At, from what we have heard, Eero will remain a, you know, a standalone brand. Uh, you know, how long that remains, et cetera, et cetera. We, we will find out. Right. Um, my biggest concern about this acquisition is not the security of it. Um, you know, it's I find it interesting that we're that 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 and, and, and don't take this the wrong way, folks, but. You know, here we are suddenly very concerned with Amazon having access to all of our data, right? Or all of our, the sites we visit. But I never heard anyone concerned that Eero had access to this. Actually, I did hear some people concerned about it, but not in the numbers that, that we have. Everybody, lots of people, not everybody, lots of people were happy to trust Eero to manage this data. And to be perfectly honest, Eero is an unknown to most of us. I, I've talked to the CEO of Eero. Uh, my guess is I might be the only one, right? Like, like amongst us here that's talked to, to Nick, that doesn't, but what does that mean? Like, even that, even though I've talked to him, what's that mean? Does it mean that, like he was an unknown quantity to me before Eero came on the, on the market? I mean, I know he did some other things and that's fine, but, uh, but I, I don't see any reason why I would trust him any more or less than I would trust Amazon and also, you know, who else had access to our data while Eero was in charge of it, right? Like, we just don't know. And I, so I'm not really, it's, it's, well, it's an unknown to a known. And I'm not that worried about it, but go ahead. You are. I, ha there are some, some things I'm worried about, but, but I'm curious to your thoughts on this, John. So, number one, I'm not worried. Okay. I mean, when, when I first got the Eero, I thought it was kind of creepy that they could remotely. Yes do some things, which was part of our, you know, initial setup experience. They're like, oh, well, you know, something's not right. Can we, uh, you know, and when I was on the phone with them, they're like, well, yeah, we can peek into your network and uh, yeah. you know, kind of tweak things to make sure it's set up right. And I'm like, okay, well, that's uh, okay. I guess I trust you guys. But the thing you have to do in, in a lot of these cases, Dave, is to see if any, if the company in question has any sort of documentation on what they do and what they don't do. And you know what I found here? So the thing is, I just did a search and I said, can Eero see my data? <laughs> and it came up with an article, which we'll link to here, called What Type of Data Does Eero Collect and Why? Now, sure, you could decide to not trust what they say and that, you know, they're evil and are collecting all of your stuff uh, and all that. But, but this, uh, uh, and with any company that you trust things to you want to see if they have some sort of privacy document or sure. a document like this and i'll, I'll get the link to it unless it's already it's all set in the show notes yeah, yeah no problem so um they explain to you what type of data they collect and the thing is i don't uh, as far as i can see they're not collecting your raw data so they're not going to be you know you know taking your credit card numbers and stuff like that no, I think people are not, people are concerned about the data that that Eero does collect as part of its normal service. What kind of devices you have in your home, right? Which yep. they definitely and, and they collect. Explain it in the, and they explain it in the document. They're right. like, yeah, we collect a bunch of stuff. We collect IP addresses. We may collect, you know, the type of devices. And, uh, you know, I guess they, if they collect your that. all your DNS queries. Now, if you have Eero Plus are theoretically loggable by by Eero. Right. And. And so, like, I mean, there is some personally identifiable data there mm -hmm. or, pri like, sure. you know, potentially private data. Like, do you want people to know that you that you have an Android phone in your house? Right. Like the Eero right. knows that you kind of want them to uh, because it helps like in, in a in an aggregate sense, knowing Oh, well, every Android phone has trouble connecting to the Wi-Fi like this. And Plume actually does this even more so than Eero, where they're really watching and creating heuristics, you know, in that whole machine learning kind of way where they say, OK, cool. Well, we now know when an, when that model Android phone tries to connect, we have to answer this way for it to be successful, not this other way, et cetera. Um, the same with the DNS stuff, you know, with the where they're doing their. Sure. You know, their parental controls and the security and all that stuff. And and they would know if you had some malware on your network, which might, again, when you're building a fingerprint about someone knowing that, OK, you've got Android devices, you got a Windows device, you have some malware, you, you know, the type of malware may 
lead someone mm-hmm. to conclude you visit certain types of websites, right? And they might even see those websites, right? So I get I get what the concern but, is, but I just yeah. like I'm not but worried. I see their statement here. So I'll just, you know, it's very quick here, but they say we don't ever track the websites you visit or collect the contents of your network traffic. And I think that's the concern with a lot of people. And they also say we don't sell our customer data and we don't sell ads based on this data. So if that's good enough for you, well, and that's but, good enough for me that they state this, then. Yeah, but okay. does this change now that Amazon is here? Like, I think that uh, that's people's concern is because they can change this anytime they want. And and I get the concern, uh, but but it, I, I mean I understand it. I don't agree with it. They do. I, I don't think, share it. I should say. Yeah, the, the thing is, if they do change the terms, saying yeah, now we're going to you know scan all your data and, and throw ads at you right and left, then mm-hmm. I think uh, that's going to bubble through the tech uh, tech universe, and people are going to abandon them, saying you know what you're doing is unacceptable. Well, so I'm going to I'm going to so. take devil's advocate here. They could if Amazon inherits this exact. Um, this exact thing where they say they don't share your data with third parties. That's fine. But now Amazon knows that you have uh, an older Apple TV and a TiVo uh, and what kind of TV you have, as well as that you have Apple devices, not just Eero knows this. Now Amazon knows this and nothing has to change about the privacy policy. So now when you visit Amazon, they could say, Hey, you should buy a new Apple TV. You might really like that. Right. Yeah. I mean, and nothing has sure. changed about the privacy policy. So I and I think that might happen. Right. Like it depends on where Amazon chooses to put the walls up, et cetera, et cetera. But it does increase Amazon's fingerprint about us. Uh, potentially. Mm-hmm. Potentially. I think Amazon knows a lot about all of us anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, uh, yeah. So I don't I don't know. I, like I hear my biggest concern it is not this. Certainly, I, like I said, I understand this concern. I don't share it. It's not my primary concern about this. I'm just not that worried about it. I use Amazon all the time. I I, I have chosen to trust them uh, with more data than I realize. And I know that, right? I'm at least aware that they're aware of far more than I have intentionally shared with them. Uh, dude, I mean, uh, we probably both have several credit cards on file with Amazon. I trust them with that. Correct. I've, I've never had anything terrible happen and that the data has been revealed. And if anything, a lot of times when I do returns and all that, they'll be like, Oh yeah, you know what? Keep it. Don't even send it back. It's it's not even worth it. No, their, their customer service is good. And, and, and that actually is my next, my big concern is my, one of my favorite parts about Eero or my favorite parts about Eero are, are really three things. Number one, the, drive towards innovation, right? They are constantly refining, adding features, updating the the product. Like we've seen things like their whole, you know, the, the QOS thing that they added in response to listener or to <laughs> listener feedback, <laughs> to user feedback, customer feedback, right? So I like that. The regular updates I like, and their level of customer service has been phenomenal. Like you call them up, they know, I mean, it's a little creepy, but they know who you are. And then like, to your point, John, they can go and like dig into, you know, your data and, and, and figure or not your data, but your settings and, and fix things and, and all of that. And that has been a very good thing. Like that, that's those three things to me are the reason that they have remained, you know, among the, the upper echelon of this more and more crowded mesh market. And I'm worried now that they are not a hungry, you know, boots or VC funded startup. And now that they are owned by and, and presumably will be sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, assimilated into the Amazon ecosystem there, uh, at least at some level. I mean, I hope Amazon does that. That would be smart, you know, from a financial standpoint, not to have like, you know, two customer service centers or whatever. Like, I don't know. Uh, I, I hope that they are able to maintain that level of uh, customer service and that pace of 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 innovation. And if they're able to do that, I think um, I, I think I think it'll be OK. But, but but time will tell. We don't know. We don't know. We have a lot of other Wi-Fi questions, though. So oh boy. and the good news is that there are lots of options. So if you are not happy with what's happening with one mesh Wi-Fi option or one Wi-Fi option in general, 
Good news. They ain't the only game in town. Russell uh, asks, he says, uh, I'm too cheap to buy a mesh system while I have plenty of capable equipment uh, uh, all over. Uh, or I <laughs> sometimes I try to paraphrase Oliver? and I Hello? fail. Who, who's uh, Oliver? What's that? No, Continue. Russell. Sorry. Oh, no. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll try this again, and I'm just going to read what Russell said. He says, I'm too cheap to buy a mesh system while I have plenty of equipment capable of covering my house and Wi-Fi. I wonder if I should continue to use different SSIDs for the networks created by all of my access points, or if I should give them the same SSID. He says, I may answer my question with my next statement. That is, my current configuration works with no complaints from my wife or my daughter. This is an important metric. Uh he says, in the upstairs south corner of my house, essentially my daughter's room, he says, I have an old airport extreme in bridge mode that creates a wireless network called balcony. He says, I think this basically is her private network and gives her all the bandwidth she ever needs for streaming and schoolwork. In the downstairs north corner of the house, I have a Synology RT 1900 AC, their first router in bridge mode that creates a network called airport. He says these match the names that were used before this equipment came into place. So my wife and daughter didn't have to change anything on their devices. Smart. He says this has good coverage for our home offices and basically the rest of the house. Uh, in the furnace room, in the middle of the downstairs, I have a Zytel C3000Z that terminates my CenturyLink uh, cable service. This is where all the Cat 5e terminates in the house, and I use its switch functions to connect to my Cat 5e infrastructure. It broadcasts a uh, CenturyLink and CenturyLink 5G Wi-Fi networks that I sometimes might connect to to be closest to the source of my internet, not that it makes much difference. I originally intended to use this to bridge to my Synology router, but it is uh, but it has features I like and the wiring location issues that convince me to just make it my primary router. So bottom line, would there be any major benefit to changing all the SSIDs to the same name? Or would it be worse than checking to see if you were connected to the wrong Wi-Fi if your internet was slow as you move around the house? Another question. He says, um, I see about a dozen networks if I hit Wi-Fi on my iDevice. Should I broadcast fewer networks to be a good neighbor or take some action to select the best band to the networks I'm broadcasting? Okay, so good questions. Um, and... I, I I will rewind back to the beginning. You know, there is the if it ain't broke, don't fix it mentality here, uh, because otherwise you wind up in a world like I live where you, you know, if it ain't broke, you fix it till it is uh, still <laughs> break it. <laughs> uh, yeah, correct. Um, you know, th th there is a thing, though, about the the multiple SSIDs. Obviously, it's working for you. So like I like I preface all of this with that. But. Mac OS and iOS still basically choose their network based on whether they can get to the network that is at the top of your preferred networks list. You can see this in Mac OS. You can't see it in iOS. But if you go into system preferences, networks, Wi-Fi, uh, and then click on advanced, you can see it there. That's the list of Wi-Fi networks. Whatever's at the top of that list, and you can reorder it right there. Uh, it will connect to if it can, uh, even if the second thing on the list has a higher signal strength. And I say this usually there are some other factors involved, but generally speaking, that's what's going to happen. So by having different network names throughout your house, it's not unforeseeable that, uh, you know, if your daughter's primary network is, say, airport, uh, it might choose that one, even though she's right next to the balcony router. Right. And so that could, you know, give her a slower scenario. You already described how to fix that. You realize it's slow. You choose the better network. You're good to go. Mm -hmm. um, I would name everything the same and let the devices decide which access point they're going to connect to. All your access points in your house are connected via Ethernet to each other. So presumably everything has, you know, this nice gigabit backhaul between it. You're going to be fine in that regard. I would change them all to the same. That way it's picking five gigahertz or 2.4, whatever is best uh, or whatever has the strongest signal, which may or may not be best, but it's going to get close. I, I think I think that's a better option for you. Yeah. As far as. The uh, the 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 good neighbor part of it, 
you're still going to be broadcasting all of these Wi-Fi networks. So in terms of congestion, it's all exactly the same, whether they're the same name, have hidden names or all have different names. It's all they're all still broadcasting. So from a, a radio standpoint, the congestion is is no different from the pollution of the airport drop down menu. Yeah. You know, having one is simpler. So sure. Uh, if you want to really worry about congestion and potentially even in your own house for better connections running your uh, if your routers let you running your wi-fi at full power versus reduced power uh, can make a big difference and oftentimes reducing the power of your wi-fi router will lead to better connections because you won't have things hmm. fighting with each other so but a lot of things don't let you adjust the power level so uh, you know this is it's, it's nice to think about but unless you have something that lets you i think your synology will i don't know about the other thing that you got on uh, the old airport extreme may or may not i can't remember so uh, what do you think about all this john so number one i agree with you is that you should give everything the same name <clears throat> and let the devices figure it out yep um or you know the thing is it doesn't hurt try it Right. That's and true. See yes. if you get better performance or not. I suspect that you will because the devices try to be smart about what they want to connect to. And that, as you pointed out, either a priority list or the signal strength or things like that. Um, it's interesting you mentioned that because I, I, I actually saw it. So uh, there's this uh, thing called Nextdoor, which is like a community, yeah. you know, chat thing. And one of the people in my area posted a thing saying, hey, I'm always connecting to um um optimum online wi-fi oh yeah not their house wi-fi sure and they're sure. like why and the thing is and the thing is um depending on if you bought the modem or if they provide it to you they may make your modem like a lot of other providers uh an access point in which case that uh but i got back to i got back to the person i said well you know if you're on a mac so i assume they were on a mac i'm like Go to the preferred networks. And the thing is, you want to remove um, anything that you don't want to connect to. And the thing is, the person got back to me and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because there were all these extraneous entries in my preferred network list, as you pointed out. Sure. Well, and even um, like if you, you may want to connect to think, you may want to connect yes. to opt online while you're out and about. So just move it. Well, this person down. doesn't. OK, yeah, well, this but person doesn't. If you do, just move it down on the list and then it'll connect but not if it sees your home network. So you can leverage I mean, the, the, this to, to your benefit. Yeah. Right. And the thing was, they didn't, the, the thing is their home devices were connecting to optimum and they didn't want that. They wanted right. to connect to theirs. And right. the reason that yeah. was doing that was because it had pollute, because by default, I think when you connect to an access point, unless you change the settings on the computer, it's going to put it in the preferred list and then it's going to screw things up. Right. But here's, work. here's why you may not want to remove opt online from your Mac. Uh, even well, if we may not remove yeah. it, but the, I, I pointed out to the person that the priority is important. So the thing is, put yours at the top. The thing is, they also wanted to they, as it turns out, deleting those solved their problem in that they for wanted now the home to connect to theirs right. and not optimum because the, there was an optimum close by. Or I think it was it was higher on her list. So it was connecting to that. She's like, I don't want that. And that's like, OK, well, here's here's how you fix that. So but here, the, wait, wait, wait. Just, here's here's continue. why you don't want to remove it from the list. Oh, no, not you, remove you, it, but change the priority. I agree with you. Well, but she removed it and she thinks it solved her problem. And this may be yeah. the case, right? It, it I'm sure it did temporarily. Here's the problem. The next time she is out at a coffee shop and it has an opt online network that she can connect to. She will do that. Right. Great. She said mm -hmm. she pays for it. All good. And it puts it at the top of the list on her iPhone, which syncs via iCloud with her Mac. And now her Mac at home has opt online back at the top of its list and it will start connecting again. So by removing it from her Mac, she has essentially created a scenario where very likely she will have it back at the top of the list by deprioritizing it. It will stay deprioritized amongst all her devices. And that's probably just fine because when she's at the coffee yes. shop, her, she can't see her home network. It will choose the opt online. All is good. Yada, yada, yada. So, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So change the priority, which that's is what right. I do. 
So I have my home network at the top of my list, and then I have Opt Online and you know whatever the other freebies there are, you know, the library. And yeah, stuff of course. Like that, yeah. Below it, right, right. Cool, good stuff. All right, uh, Ian has a question. I'm trying to kind of walk us through a little uh, path here, uh, mm-hmm. picking and choosing our our Wi-Fi related questions. Uh, Ian has a question sort of next in the queue. He says, my current router access point is a Netgear Nighthawk AC 1900. He's got a handful of devices, maybe maybe two handfuls of devices for wired <laughs> for wireless and another handful of wired clients. He says, I've heard you recommending the Synology RT2600 AC as the best standalone router. He says, my house is probably not big enough to justify mesh. He says, I've already got a Synology disk station, so the ability to run packages in the router really doesn't add much functionality for me, which I agree with. He says, do you reckon the upgrade from the Netgear Nighthawk AC1900 to the Synology RT2600 RT2600 AC is worth doing? Um, and, and so my question here is, and I do still stand by, like my recommendation hasn't changed. My favorite standalone router by far is the Synology. Really, it's a fantastic router, the RT2600 AC. Uh, however, for Ian, my question back to you would be, what problem or problems are you looking to solve or perhaps look at a little differently? What capabilities are you looking to add The answer to the latter, I think, is none because you already have this DS718 plus so you can do, uh, you know, inbound VPN. You can do Synology Drive or Cloud Station. You know, you can do all those things that the router would also let you do. So I guess my question is, is there a problem? If the problem is Wi-Fi range, speed or coverage, the RT2600 AC's additional radios, because remember, that's a four by four router, not a three by three. might help quite a bit. That's a, I mean, it's a really strong router. Um, so there you go. He says, but, but I don't, I don't think that's your problem because if it was, you'd probably would have said, maybe I need mesh because I don't have good coverage. Right. And maybe you did, or maybe you didn't. Um, but he didn't say that. So I don't I like upgrading for the sake of upgrading because objectively this is a more capable device if you don't need any of those capabilities, I would say, no, stick with what you have, ride it out until such time as you do need some capabilities and reevaluate, you know, based on what's available in the market. Then that would, that would be my thought, John. I concur. Although, so if you look at the numbers here, AC 1900 versus 2600. Okay. So obviously the 2600 has more capabilities, but as you pointed out, is Does there a problem them? you're trying to solve? Right. Uh, unless you're not getting enough, uh, you know, if you're streaming something or, or whatever, if you're, if it's stuttering and it's getting pixelated and stuff like that, that, that would be the only reason, uh, you know, as, as I guess you pointed out is that you don't have enough oomph and you need more oomph. Yeah. In which case maybe it does make sense to upgrade your, uh, your base station, but because it's the same class, I think that's cool. Yeah. Or, or I, I think it's, it's, those two Probably are close unlikely. enough. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, yeah. they're both AC. I mean, the thing is, my my, exactly. uh, my sister, they, they had some catastrophe. And the thing is, they had an 802.11N uh, Wi-Fi. And I'm like, you know what? Uh, oh. I think there's something wrong with it. Get an AC. And they were like, oh, my gosh. Like, the speeds are so much better. I'm like, yeah. So yeah. If, if you're upgrading from a prior standard yeah yeah i would say that you should probably do but within the same space eh, yeah 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 no i totally yes exactly yeah it doesn't doesn't sound like for ian that this is uh something that that he would that that he really needs i don't think you'd notice a difference to be to be perfectly honest i think you're gonna be fine um but you know i do like i said that that rt2600 ac if you're looking for a new router and you you don't need anything like a mesh system, even if you do right now, Synology has their mesh and you can add things to their mesh. You can even get the MR2200 AC. That's their mesh router, which can be a mesh point for the main Synology router, or it can be a router all by itself. 
So that's it's a little a little less expensive way to get into Synology and you get a tri-band router with that MR2200 AC. So that's also not a bad router to consider. In fact, there's probably uh, some segment of the population for whom I would recommend that instead of the RT2600. So lots of options out there, but Synology is doing a good job in the standalone router market for sure. Uh, for sure. Uh, you know, we have, uh, a few more Wi-Fi questions to answer, John, but, uh, but first, uh, but first, if it's okay with you, mm-hmm. I'd like to talk about <laughs> our, uh, our next two sponsors. <laughs> okay. All right. I'd like to thank hair club for being a sponsor of Mac geek gab today. I know what you're thinking. What does hair club have to do with Mac geek gab? We asked this question too, because, We want to have sponsors that fit for you. And as I learned more about Hair Club and who they can help the most and how they can help, it became obvious why they were interested here in Mac Geek Gab and how much of a great fit it really is. Look, confidence is important. We know that, right? We talk a lot about that on this show by way of making sure you know what you're doing when you're doing things. And sometimes one change can make all the difference. And Hair Club knows this. And that's why they're inviting you to become part of the Hair Club family to see how getting the most out of your hair can change your life. John and I are extremely fortunate middle aged men in that we both have full heads of hair, sometimes more hair than we even need. And that is a wonderful thing. In fact, we want that wonderful thing for all of you. So does Hair Club. They understand the emotions you're feeling and the questions you have. They are the leader in total hair solutions with a legacy of success that lasts over 40 years. And whether you're looking to revitalize the growth of your own hair or to learn more about the latest proven methods for hair replacement or restoration, Hair Club's professionally trained stylists, hair health experts, and consultants will craft a personalized solution to ensure you feel your best and get the most out of your hair. See for yourself just how powerful great hair can be. John and I can tell you how powerful it can be. And here's the cool thing. If you go to hairclub.com slash MGG today, you get a free hair analysis and a free take home hair care kit, all valued at over 300 bucks. Again, that's hairclub.com slash MGG for a free hair analysis and a free hair care kit. Hairclub.com slash MGG. Experience your hair and your life at its best only with Hair Club. Hairclub.com slash MGG. Our thanks to Hair Club for sponsoring this episode. Next, I'd like to thank Captera for being a sponsor of Mac Geek Gab today. Do you remember 1989 when the World Wide Web was invented? You know, we've come a long way in 30 years. So why does it feel like sometimes the software that we use every day at work is stuck in the past? Take a leap into the future by finding the right software for your business at Captera.com. Captera is the leading free online resource to help you find the best software solutions for your business. They have over 700,000 reviews of products from real users. Discover everything you need to make an informed decision by checking out these reviews and finding the software that's going to work for you, no matter what kind of software your business needs, right? Captera makes it easy to discover the right solution quickly. You put in what you're looking for and they've got it right. And they tell you all about it. So you're not having to test a million things yourself, right? We do this here on the show. We have like cool stuff found. Captera is full of cool stuff found. That's what they have. So check it out. Join the millions of people who use Captera each month to find the right tools for their businesses. Visit Captera.com slash MGG today for free. And you can find the right tools to make 2019 the year for your business. Again, it's all free. Captera.com slash MGG. Captera. That's C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash MGG. Just go. It's free. And you can support the show while doing it. Captera.com slash MGG. Our thanks to Captera for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. I think it's time to talk to Dan. A different Dan. but. Dan, nonetheless, because Dan asks back to the Wi-Fi, he says, here's my situation. I'm running an Apple time capsule, one of those 802.11C models, 
uh, AC, 802.11 AC models, along with an airport express. The express, he says, appears to have given up the ghost and died. I tried resetting it, but it doesn't seem to power up. The time capsule still running fine. In looking at extenders to replace the express, I was looking at a Netgear one as well as one from D-Link. Would it work well to mix brands between the main base station and an extender or would that be difficult to set up? Uh, he says, I like the airport stuff due to accessibility and ease of use uh, of airport utilities. He says, I'm a voiceover user, so I wouldn't want to get something that was horribly inaccessible uh, with a web interface to administer it or that had a horribly inaccessible web interface. Some web, web interfaces are great. He says, uh, if you think it'd be best to replace everything with a mesh solution, which out of the mesh, mesh solutions uh, would you recommend? I know you've tested them all, so I figured I'd reach out and ask. Okay. Um, so a few questions sort of baked in here that walk us down our, our Wi-Fi path today. As far as mixing brands, it's generally fine. Um, it's all Wi-Fi. Uh, so as long as you're buying an extender and not something geared only for a specific mesh system, but as long as you're buying a, you know, a, an extender that's built to extend any network, it's going to work. Now, let's narrow that down a little bit. Some stuff like the new Nighthawk mesh line from Netgear is interesting. It'll join and help any Wi-Fi network, but it also tries to add some meshing smarts as best it can to it, keeping the same uh, SSID as we talked about before, trying to do some intelligent like steering of the clients as again, as best it can. Um, and if your original router were a Netgear Nighthawk mesh capable router, uh, then suddenly it would become much more like a, a, a full-blown mesh system, right? Which is cool. Um, as for whether a full-blown mesh system is better for you, it's hard to say, right? It would uh, certainly give you a single interface from which to manage everything. That's one of the big benefits of, of mesh. So, and, and objectively, that's better uh, in most cases, right? Uh, you might like the level of configurability on your current network, and going to a mesh or any other router would change that, right? With more or less configurability, depending on what you choose. Uh, and, you know, it's different. Change is change, right? So, uh, so there you go. You know, um, I, I think you're going to be fine. It, you know, the, um, as far as extenders go, Ubiquity has their consumer mesh line that they call Amplify, A-M-P-L-I-F-I. And, I really like the what they've done with that. They, I mean, they've been doing that for several years. It's not a new thing, but they do have these what they call their mesh point HD units that plug directly into the wall and are extenders for any network, not just theirs. So this would work for you. And it does start to add some of that meshing stuff to it and works fairly well. Uh, it may or may not be the thing that you want. You might want something with Ethernet ports. Those don't have them. Uh, so that might not be the thing. But, um, but you know, there you go. Uh, thoughts on that, John? Um, I've actually had hands-on. I haven't had hands-on with Netgear or D-Link extenders, but I have had hands-on experience. And I think you even brought me one one time, a TP-Link one. So check mm -hmm. them out also. They they have a pretty, pretty wide variety of uh, extenders. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Sorry. But, yeah. um, but no. I agree with you that, um, you know, a, a basic extender, as long as we're talking AC, because I think if it's anything pre AC, the, the chatter and work. the efficiency is yeah. just not going to cut it. Whereas uh, an AC or solution, extender solution is, is, uh, probably what you're looking for. Yeah. yeah. Or mesh, but, um, you yeah. know, again, that entails, a. Yeah, well, uh, I would say replacing what died with a with an extender is something to try, and they're not terribly expensive. They're, uh, I mean, they're you know, hundred bucks or something, or yeah. you know, a couple hundred bucks maybe. Yeah, it's true, um, and that that's the thing, right? If you were to jump to a a full blown mesh system right now, you would be adding you know a, a substantial cost to to what you're you know you're talking about here. Like you said, you know, you're you're looking at a hundred less than one hundred and fifty bucks to get a decent you know, 802.11 AC extender, maybe even less than a hundred bucks going to a mesh system. You're at at least 200, probably closer to three, three fifty. you know, by the time all is said and done. So, um, yeah, I, I would, I, you know, the, the one 
thing you could do. Well, it, it, you know, um, you could buy one of those Amplify HD mesh points, right? That will work with this. And then when it's time to replace your router, you could replace it with the Amplify mesh router. And now, you, you know, you're, you're sort of piecemealing yourself into this realm. You could do the same thing with the Netgear Nighthawk mesh stuff. Buy a Nighthawk mesh extender, do that. Then when it's time, you replace your router with a Nighthawk mesh capable router. And now, you know, you've, you've, you've sort of, you know, baby stepping yourself into that ecosystem without wasting any money and having to throw away this extender because you're replacing it. I, you know, I don't know. There you go. Uh, that's right. I think that's, that's that. Um, mm -hmm. Last week, John, I, I talked about the beginnings of my um, experience here with Unify, which is sort of the prosumer level of Ubiquity's mesh products. And when I test a new mesh system here, what I like to do is the first thing I do is I set it up uh, as a, a, what I call double NAT, right, where I let it be its own router and it controls its own mesh points, but it's a sub network of my local network, right? I, I don't connect the family to it. I just connect my devices to it. I let it be in this double NAT scenario where I have two routers, you know, one running under the other. And, and it's good because I can test it without screwing everybody else up too much. And then step two is usually promoting it up one level and being my family's Wi-Fi for everything. But I do that by putting the router in bridge mode so that I don't have to, you know, once a week reprogram my router, you know, and put a new, completely new router in place for my entire network. I leave these days. It's the Synology, the RT 2600 AC. That's the router that manages my network. And then all of my mesh stuff lives, you know, kind of below that in bridge mode. And so it was time to promote this Unify thing up, John, to bridge mode. But the Unify security gateway, which is the router. I mentioned this is a modular system, right? Where you've got the, the router is one thing, the mesh points are another, the switch is another, and then the remote access, you know, controller that is the interface for everything is yet another device. And I looked into this and you cannot put the security gateway, the router into bridge mode. You can, but it requires like a lot of terminal foo. And it just seemed a little bit like, whoa, and I don't know that I want to do that. And I thought, wow, crap, that sucks. What am I going to do? I really want to test, you know, the, the, the rest of this stuff. And then it hit me, John, as I was, uh, you know, like, I don't know, doing the dishes or driving or one of those things where you're not really thinking and your mind gets to kind of do some work on, on its own in the background, you know? And uh, and it hit me. It was like, wait a minute. We talk here on the show all the time. What what is bridge mode? Right. Well, bridge mode is when, you know, we always say that your router in most cases, not with Unify, but in most cases, your router is a three in one device. Right. It's a uh, a, a switch. Right. It's an Ethernet switch. It is a wireless access point And it's a router. Right. It does. It takes your signal from the outside world and routes it to these other devices on the inside world. Well, with Unify, everything is separate. And when we put something in bridge mode, like, you know, a normal router, when we do that, essentially what we're doing is we're turning off one of those three functions. Right. We're turning off the router function and leaving the switch and the uh, access points, the wireless access points on like, well, wait a minute. I know how to do that. I can just turn off the router like it's literally a separate device. That's bridge mode. So that's what I did. And that's what's running in my house now. It worked totally fine. Uh, yeah. Everything else worked. You know, the controller device was like, yeah, no problem. And uh, and it's great. And so I've been testing that and actually very happy with it. I was I got some Wi-Fi speeds that blew me away. I think I sent you a speed test, John, that was like, what, mm -hmm. 520 megabits per second on my iPhone or something, which is pretty down. Good. Yeah. Down. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty smoking at 40 up, which is pretty good. In this 40, stage 40 well. up is what my cable company gives me. Yeah. But but being yeah. well, I mean, no, I got the same on Ethernet. I get a thousand down, but uh, oh, sure. Yeah, but with Wi-Fi, getting anything over 500 on a on my two by two device on my iPhone is pretty. That's pretty strong. So. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because that's your limitation is the correct. The streams. Correct. The number of streams. That's it. The radios in the iPhone. 
And in this case, you are crossing the streams. That's the idea. You want to combine them even. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so listener Keith, I, he had sent it like a few days before I had this, you know, this realization Keith had sent in a, a big, long message to us about Unify, and I saw it come in. I'm like, oh, I got to read that. And so I did read it this weekend. And I wish I had read it earlier because, of course, he explained all of this. He's like, dude, just turn off the router. You're fine. But Keith actually offers a different perspective on Unify in general that I thought would be very helpful because we talked about it last week. And, you know, we started doing the math and it was like, wow, it's like 600 bucks to get here. Well, Keith points out. I installed a couple of Unify access points in my home roughly two years ago, and I've been very happy with them. Uh, he says, I have one in my radio shack and one downstairs. And between them, they give excellent coverage. Uh, he said one would probably have been enough, but two is always better than one, right? He says, I, however, I have been able to save some cash compared to the setup you described. He says, I don't own a Unify security gateway, the router, because as you suggested, it's just a router. He says, I use my Netgear router with the inbuilt Wi-Fi switched off. He said, it's literally providing a connection between my cable modem and my access points. He says, it could be providing DHCP, but that's where the other cost saving comes in. He says, I also don't have a cloud key. That's the device that provides a controller for the Unify network. He said, instead, I'm running the Unify controller software on a Raspberry Pi, which works perfectly. It sits in my shack and just percolates along doing what it has to do. He says it's also configured as my DHCP server for the entire network. He says, of course, I could have left DHCP on in my router, but I like to tinker. Um, and he talks about how he has uh, his SSIDs set the same on the two access points. His clients swap seamlessly between them. He also has a guest wireless network configured with a different SSID, which is isolated uh, and has around 10 percent of the bandwidth allocated to it. That is one of the cool things about Unify is you can really control things. I wanted to have one network that was only coming from one of the three access points that I have because I really wanted to test something and I wanted to know, can I get to this, you know, this one access point from other places? So I just added a second wireless network to my Unify setup and I said only assign it to that access point and only assign it on the five gigahertz band, not the two, not the 2.4. And it's like, OK, no problem. Super flexible because it it is that prosumer kind of, you know, enterprise ish kind of stuff. Um, he says, I've effectively reduced the cost massively by not buying a cloud key or a security gateway. All I had to buy, he says, were two access points and I downloaded the software and put it on my Raspberry Pi. And he says, I love this setup. So very cool. It's it's just an interesting way of thinking with all this stuff that's modular. You don't have to have it all. You can buy the modules that work for you. So thanks for sharing that, Keith. It's it's a good perspective on this kind of different take on on a, a mesh setup. So pretty good, huh, John? Yeah. So well, I want it all. Well, not do all. you? I don't know. Like no. I have that security gateway turned off right now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. And things are working. It's I, I'm actually kind of liking it. It would be nice to have my router in the same interface, you know, like that. That would be good. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. I honestly, I think the Synology router is more capable for us home users than the Unify Security Gateway is in terms of like the VPN options that can come in and the uh, cloud station and, you know, all of that stuff. It's, uh, you know, yeah, it's interesting. All right. Uh, interesting question from listener Eric using Powerline. He says, I've decided to go solar this year. My system will have a control box that collects data and uploads it to the solar company's website so that production statistics can be tracked. I believe my Wi-Fi single single signal is strong <laughs> enough to reach the exterior control box. But for a stronger, more consistent connection, the design team would like to install a power line adapter near my router connected to my router by an Ethernet cable. What network safety and privacy am I giving up by allowing the power line adapter to be attached to my router via Ethernet? Would I give up less network safety and privacy if it was a Wi-Fi type thing or if the control box was con connected by Wi-Fi without that? What would you recommend? So this is a good question. So right. wait, is is the proposal to have a physical connection to the control box instead of a Wi-Fi connection? Is that well, what a, did I hear that? The, yeah, they want a physical connection. 
They, I, my, my okay, they're proposing that a physical connection over power line to this. Box. Yeah, I mean, I think they would prefer a, okay. a, a straight Ethernet cable, but that doesn't exist. So in lieu of that, I think they're saying, yeah, you know, just use power line. That way, it's still a wired connection, uh, albeit, you know, with power line in the middle. Um, and so th- security wise, this is a, it's an interesting question, right? Because the risk with power line is that by default, once you have one power line device plugged into your network, it means that any power line device uh, that is plugged into your house's electrical system would be able to see all your Ethernet data. And all is the should put an asterisk. Right. On. Right. OK, so the risk is uh, and to me, I, I would say the risk assessment here is very low is like. If you've got people plugging into your wall to try to monitor your network traffic, you have bigger problems than network security. <laughs> that, yeah, that would right? be my feeling. Like if somebody's running around inside my house with a power line adapter, I, that's the, the <laughs> fact that they have the power line adapter is is sort of, you know, like we're talking about deck chairs on the Titanic here. Right. Like it's, it's, there's so other problems. Have, the thing is, I do have and you probably do as well. So the thing is, I do have a power uh, a plug on my deck, which it's is outside. True. So in theory, somebody could waltz onto my property. Yep. And if I had power line and it's on the same branch, could plug in and could monitor my traffic if uh, security was not enabled. But I guess that's. But that's the, the trick. I don't right. want to steal thunder here. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. No, you, you, you're, you're painting the right picture because that, that is a, a reasonable assumption. All power line traffic is encrypted, but. It uses the default encryption encryption path. Yeah. So it's all encrypted, but everybody has the same password unless you change that. And you can force your power line units to change it. You get them all plugged in. So in in Eric's case, you'd plug two in. But when you set up one, is there an I've I've never done power line, but I'm I'm going to assume that when you set one up at some point, it'll say, hey, would you like to have a password applied or, or maybe there's a default. Yeah. I, I think you were saying this. So sorry, but no, um, it's okay. There's probably a default password that'll provide a level of encryption. But I think as you're suggesting, changing that password is probably a good idea. Yeah. But it's not obvious that any of this is happening because generally speaking, when you install power line, there's zero software, right? You just plug the things in and they do their magic. That's it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's because they're both using the default password. On each power line unit, generally, there's a little button and you can push the button on one and it and put it into like security mode and then go to the other one within 30 seconds and push its button. And now between the two of them, or if there's three or four in your house, whatever it is, they will negotiate their own key that is now unique to your house or randomized and presumably unique to your house. And then you're good to go. And if you plug in a third one or, you know, in Eric's case, it wouldn't be able to see any of that traffic because it's it's using a different encryption key. So, I, you know, in that I, that that's the solution. I, I in general, I wouldn't worry about it. But but to your point, John, you know, you might have a, a an outlet outside that someone could poke into or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Um, yes. No, I'm with you. I actually, I uh, I would think in almost every case, I would trust the physical connection versus a wireless connection as far as potential for being exploited. Yeah. Hmm. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think Wi-Fi's encryption is probably stronger. Like WPA2 is stronger than power lines, I, I think. Um, but, you know, in general. The thing is. Yeah. <sighs> When I was in the corporate space, I always thought it was hilarious is that they had all this focus on Wi-Fi security and we did a Cisco infrastructure, but we had Ethernet ports in every office in the building. Right. It's right. like, if I was going to attack somebody, Just I'd plug, plug in, into right? the wall because That's typically, I mean, there is software that can manage uh, physical connections and say, oh, you're not on the list. So I'm, I'm not going to authorize you to get on the network, but that's atypical from what i've seen most of the time hey you plug into ethernet you, you yeah you're, you're good, good to man. go you get an, you get an address and you can see you know depending on how they're set up you can see traffic and monitor traffic and uh my my daughter you know she goes to the university of new hampshire here now and 
in the dorms, they have, I mean, they have Wi-Fi everywhere. Uh, and, but of course she has to authenticate through a, like a captive portal kind of thing with her student ID and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. If she, what's that? Yeah, no, yeah. I, I get okay. it. If she connects to ethernet and there are ethernet ports in the rooms that most people don't use. If she connects to ethernet, she also has to authenticate through the captive portal. <sighs> really? Yeah. Okay. Which means if like for kids that want to use like an Amazon, a lady or, you know, uh, you know, the, the, like a, a Google assistant device or some people want to run their own routers and, so, and kids do for perhaps gaming systems or, you know, whatever you have to call, uh, you know, campus, whatever it services, whatever they call it. And give them the MAC address of this device that you're going to plug in. And then they go in and assign it to your account and allow it to just, you know, be used without having to. Because you can't get, you know, an Amazon Echo unit to go through the captive portal, right? Like there's no interface for that. So they just have to authenticate it on the back end. They put it in and you're good to go. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So so there are some kids that use that just put routers in their room. And and that way it's nice if like if you wanted to use an Apple TV or something like that. You can because otherwise if you put your Apple TV on uh on the main campus network, well, mm-hmm. now everybody gets to see your Apple TV. That may or may hey. not be what you wanted. Yes. <laughs> or a, a network printer, right? Same kind of thing. So it's like, yeah. All right. Interesting, interesting. Uh, speaking of paying for college and and really just uh, helping support the show in general, I want to thank all of our premium supporters that have uh, whose contributions have come in throughout the week. Of course, our premium uh, program was created well, really in response to those of you that wanted to find uh, an additional way to help support us here, and we are ever so thankful. It really does help, and uh, and we do some things for our premium listeners, including. Probably the, the the thing that most people like, well, maybe the second to uh, to just that warm, fuzzy feeling you get from supporting your two favorite geeks is our premium at MacGeekGab.com email address that gets prioritized when uh, when your emails come in. On our monthly ten dollar plan uh, in the last week, I would like to shout out thanks to Ari L, Michael P, Barry F, Bob L. Timothy G, Jeff P, John D, Santiago M, and John V, and our biannual plan, uh, which is 25 every six months by default, Elliot G, Kevin S, Jim M, J, Richard F, Harry M, Mike P, David R, Tom M Jr., Matthias S at $30 every six months, Dimitri S, and Drew T. Thank you to all of you. You rock. All right, John, we've got uh, we've got some time here. How about we how about we answer some questions, shall we? Some non Wi-Fi sure. questions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Alan writes, he says, I'm looking for your recommendations on a specific model flash drive that has both a USB C and a USB A connector on it. Uh, he says, I plan to use it as a boot disk for a wide range of computers at work that may need OSs reinstalled, utilities done, et cetera. He says, I plan to make several partitions on it and make it make bootable installers of different versions of Mac OS, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The good question. Um, so this is it, it's interesting. In researching this, I found a few things, John, I really three things that I'm going to talk about here. I'm curious, of course, if anybody has any ideas uh, but the first is the first two are just USB um, flash drives, 128 gigs, right? And the first one has uh, it looks like a normal USB stick, but it has two ends to it. And one end is USB A and the other end is USB C. And it's uh, 30 bucks for 128 gigs uh, for a flash drive. And well, I, I, reviews look okay on it at Amazon. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, so there you go. Right? Thoughts on that, John? You know, um, pretty good. I'm I'm gonna wait until you finish. Okay. All right. You're gonna. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I I have some thoughts, but um, okay. I, cool. I want you to. All right. So I'll 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 put um uh, I'll put uh I'll put them both in the uh in the they're basically the same thing. One has like a swivel 
cover on it and the other just has like the little removable covers. So I will put them both in, uh, in the show notes. And then my, and, and I think the second one that I found is, uh, let me look here and just make sure I get the pricing right. The first one was 30 bucks for 128 gigs. This one's $36 for 128 gigs. So same kind of thing. And, and it, actually this other one also has a micro USB port, like the USB a port. It's worth looking. It's Sunswan branded. And, uh, and you like open, you flip open the USB A port, and it has a little micro USB port inside it. I've never seen anything like this, but uh, it looks mm. looks like it would work. So, anyway, there's that. Uh, and then, lastly, but uh, certainly not leastly, and perhaps the best solution, or at least the best I came up with. Oh no, now I am, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting with anticipation. Antisip- antisip- patient here uh is the uh amazon basics usb type c to usb 3.1 gen 1 female adapter which is a long way of saying it has a usb c port on one end that you could plug into a computer and a female usb a port on the other so you get a usb a uh flash drive or uh, external ssd and you use this cable to convert between A and C, depending on whatever computer you're plugging into. And that opens up the world of possibilities to you all for just eight bucks. So I think number three is what I would go with in this scenario. But, you know, there you go. What do you have, John? Well, I'm with you in that the first two devices that you find and, you know, congrats for finding them. But these are companies that I've never heard of. I mean, it's well, 30 but bucks. They're flash, okay, so. they're flash drives. Like, it doesn't really matter. Like, flash drives are flash drives. We all use flash no, drives. We don't I, I even get, know I the vendor, it. right? You know, I get it. But I concur with you. Is that I? I think the Amazon converter, which is also Amazon's choice, and also it's seven ninety nine. So I mean, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I would go with that. Yeah. Um, for flexibility, I, I, I'd rather not tie myself into a device from a company that uh, I'm not familiar with. Whereas, yeah, yeah, I Amazon guess so. Basics, everything, anything I've got from Amazon Basics, and Am- and especially it says Amazon's Choice. Uh, I, I've never gone wrong with getting something under under those banners. I agree so. with that. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although with a flash drive, I mean, so many of us use. You know, we repurpose a flash drive that we got at you know some trade show or whatever. And who knows what brand that is, right? Like it doesn't even have a it. Well, I know what brand name it has on it, but it has nothing to do with the company that made the flash drive. It's whoever gave it yes. to me, you know. So I literally, Dave, probably like you, have cupfuls of flash drives. Literally, I try and I, give I, I try and give them away as fast as I can, and I still always have like thirty of them. So yeah, I I, I have hundreds, and the thing is, I'm I'm actually, I, and I've talked to some vendors about this. It would be wonderful if I could take all of the flash drives that I have from all the vendors that have given them to me and make them into some sort of huge array. You can. Why couldn't well, you? Uh, I I haven't seen. Uh, it would it would need a USB dock with enough ports to accept hundreds of. <laughs> Yeah, but think about drives, that. And then right? I'd have to raid and stitch them together. Yeah, and, but yeah, Apple's so. soft raid would do that, right? So you could do this. And they make those USB ports or those USB hubs that were for like the Bitcoin miners that have like 30. Mm-hmm. You, you know, it's powered USB oh, okay. hub for like 30 things. That might, right. like you might be able to do, that would be an interesting thing. Because on their own, they're all really slow, right? But if you've got 30 of them. You might actually get some decent speed out of it, dude. Oh, and if yeah. you raid them, yeah, I mean, exactly. You know, I got ones that right. are one gig, two gig, four gig, maybe eight gig. Yeah. But, oh. uh, I, I probably have a terabyte of USB storage stored in. Uh, it's just. And think about the fault out. tolerance, right? If one of them dies, so what? You throw it away. Doesn't matter. Just put another, plug another one in. <laughs> huh? This Good could stuff. be an interesting thing, John. All right. I, I now I have a mission. I may have a personal. I may have a personal yeah. project here. My mission is I mean, to I, make I, sure I, you do this project. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I've approached vendors, and I'm like, you know, like Lexar. One time, I saw them. They have something that's kind of like this, but it only has a limited number of ports. And I was like, why don't you make one that has like hundreds of USB ports? And they're like, eh, go away. <laughs> yeah. No. 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 Like, yeah. You want like a thirty port USB hub. 
Right. I'm searching Amazon. Mm -hmm. Okay. I found a 10 port hub for 40 bucks. I found a 28 port hub, John. Here it is. 30 All port right. hub. We're getting there. Oh. Because there has to be. Because 60 ports, so John. All right. Now we're talking. All right. Yeah. Send me the link or I'm something. Put, I may do the it. link in the show notes. I, I may rate it. I, yeah. I may I may get one of the. How much is it? Is 109 it? bucks. Okay. It's got a huge fan in it, man. You got to check this thing out. <laughs> I'm going to try it. <laughs> I think I'm going to try it. 60 okay. port. That's crazy. All right. Well, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, this one. Uh, this is not a hub. This is a charging station. So no. th this won't do what you need. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it certainly looks impressive. I'm still putting it in the show notes uh, because, of you know, obviously. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. No, right. the um, the the Bitcoin so miners it's a use charging it. charging station. Is that it? Well, mm. it's a power station, right? So the Bitcoin mm. miners okay. use these to power their Raspberry Pis that... <laughs> As a cluster can, you know, could, I don't know if they, people still do it this way, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. That's not it. Dang it. That's okay. Let's wrap things up. Why? This is such a fun little tangent to be down here though, John, we got to find this do more research. You. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, you want to bring us to Andrew, John? I'm going to bring us to Andrew because he asks a very good question and he actually introduces I'm actually kind of disappointed we haven't had a fish shake yet in the oh, show but this right. is a fish shake and Andrew says hi Dave and John am I going insane or just not with it as I don't think the purchased category exists in the Mac App Store in Mojave I wanted to re-download apps I previously purchased and think I must have missed something it's probably right in front of my eyes well not really but um, I will agree with you Andrew in that you're right there is not an explicit purchased category. You think it'd be listed in the store menu. So if you access the uh, app store, there's a store menu and it has a whole bunch of choices that pretty much mirror what you see in the UI. Um, but there is a way to get to this. And I actually had to dig as well. And I was actually kind of surprised when I ran the app store and I'm like, where the heck's the purchase stuff? He's right. Here's what you want to do. You want to go to either store and then there's a view my account menu. And if you go to that, and there's another way to get to it. There's also, if you open the App Store in the latest Mac OS, you're going to see in the lower left-hand corner uh, your iCloud avatar and the amount of money that you have in your account, which is, is good to know. You click on that, that gets you to the same place. And if you go to the same place, Dave, it's the account page, but you know what's in the account page? Your purchase list. How stupid is that? I'm sorry. I... I <laughs> Now, the other thing is that if you're in the app store, you, you will see is that if you if you hover over the, 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 to the right of the app, you're going to get, uh, I guess, the equivalent of a share menu. And it's going to say, oh, you can hide purchase. You can copy the link to it and, and things like that. But basically, I would agree that this UI, it's a UI oversight. It's like, why would you move something that I already knew about? It It is weird. And in iOS, like something similar happened, right? In order to see your purchases, it, especially if you have a family account, you have to go to, uh, uh, you know, like, like you tap on your name, like you go to updates and then tap on your picture and then you can go to purchased, right? And and then, you know, dig further and further in from there. Yeah, it, it is. I'm, I'm with you. It is kind of weird. Yeah. I mean, it's like iTunes. Every now and then iTunes, it's like, where's the thing that I used to see in the sidebar? Why did, why did you hide that? So, yeah. And Andrew wrote back and, and basically shook his fist saying, why, why are they doing this? Uh, to me, it doesn't, well, you know, I'll, I'll have to say they made, on the one hand, they made the Mac app store similar to the iOS app store in that, you know, you got the same progress icons and, and it kind of looks the same. And that's a pretty recent change. But so maybe it's not. Uh, so maybe to your point, it is consistent with what they did on iOS. And oh. At some point, they decided we got to take that step, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, the Mac App Store is definitely more iOS like than it used to be. That is right? true. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Like if we. If we go with the iOSification to steal Ted Landau's term, that that now it actually makes more sense. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So John, it's a little I, speed bump. But yeah, it's there. Okay. Yeah. 
I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. I also found you a 28 port hub for 65 bucks. So I, I'll, I'll put that Ooh. link in the show notes. Like this might be your thing. <laughs> and it shows a couple of USB thumb drives plugged into it. So like, this is good. This is good. Hey, me, that's the dream. I want to plug all my thumb drives into something and access them as a huge. Array. Yeah. Just J bod mm-hmm. them. Right. Don't even yep. worry about rating them. Just J bod them and see what happens. Right. Don't worry about fault mm-hmm. tolerance. Just like, you know, boom, there you go. Uh, crazy. In the forums, we had, uh, we had someone and I'm pulling it up here. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you their name in a minute. We had United 9198, right? I'm running high Sierra on my Mac and suddenly my Safari app will not retain my homepage setting and keeps reverting to the default Apple website. I've tried everything I can think of and have been unable to come up with a way to fix this. I even created a new admin identity and tried that without success. Upgrading to Mojave is currently off the table. Okay. Um, This is interesting, right? Like if it, even if it were just in a user account, I'd still be worried. But um, in a system wide sense, I'm especially worried. And the reason I'm worried is because one of the attack vectors for malware is your homepage. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this, a lot of people will set their homepage to Google, right? Or something. And, and if a malware vendor creates a homepage that looks close enough to Google's, you know, homepage, you'll use that and you might search for stuff and they might even send you to different places, but they might be sending you to places where they have baked in, you know, affiliate codes or other things that earn this malware vendor money. And, you know, when you multiply that by tens of thousands of computers uh, of unsuspecting users, then you might actually, you know, make some, uh, you know, you might make some real money with this. There's a there's a reason for it. The fact that your homepage keeps changing and the fact that it keeps changing even with another admin account makes me a little concerned. I would download and run malware bytes just to make sure that you are not subject to some poorly written malware that's trying to change Safari's homepage failing and causing Safari to reset to its default, which is Apple. So the good news is whatever's happening, it's not malware like, or the malware people aren't winning, even if it is malware, but you, you probably want to scan your system and make sure that you don't have some malware on there. That's, that's one of those things. So the reason I wanted to include it in the show is so that everybody can kind of remember that that homepage location is in many, many cases of target vector for an attack vector for, for malware. Just like we talked in a, a couple episodes ago about uh, profiles being another, you know, attack vector. This is one as well. So check that out. Thoughts on that, John? Uh, we think alike because my, that, that was my same concern is if something is cha- if your homepage is changing, and you didn't do it, then somebody else did. And right. Yeah, probably. And that's a common, yeah, a common thing. They, they'll they direct you to a page where, yeah, you know, they get, you know, money for clicks and, and stuff like that, as, as, as I think you suggested. So, yeah. yeah. Malware bytes, I think, would be the first place to start. Yeah, I, I run malware bytes once a week and let it scan all my, you know, all my computers. And um, it, thus far, it hasn't found anything on mine, but that, doesn't stop me from running it once a week. <laughs> Do I? Well, no, I have it too. It's part of Eero. So Eero Plus offers you malware bytes. Uh, the, yep. The super duper version. Right. I don't like malware bytes running in the background. So I don't oh, the real time ha- version. I don't have the real time thing running. I just so I, you do the manual. OK, right. well, so we talked earlier in this episode about keyboard maestro being the future of automation on the Mac. I wrote <laughs> okay. a a keyboard maestro macro that triggers at 8 30 a.m on sunday morning and it launches malware bytes waits a few seconds clicks the button that says scan now and scans my computer and it's weird on the computer in the studio it works flawlessly on the computer in the office i would say it works 50 percent of the time but in either case i do not have it then quit malware bytes so i when i launch the computer either later on sunday morning or at any point on monday I see the malware bytes window there 
and it shows me when it was last scanned. So if the office it doesn't say last scanned yesterday at 8.30 a.m., well, I can click the scan now button and then it scans for me on Monday morning. So it's all good. Yeah. Yeah. I guess my only reservation is that, as you recall in the past, they uh, they had a little uh, problem with the massive memory leak with their real time stuff. That's why I don't me- I, I don't like the real time stuff. I mean, their memory leak notwithstanding real time choose processor, I think, as well. It uses disk that. space or disk. Yeah. Time. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. OK. So, so I think I get your strategy of doing it manually rather than enabling. Yeah, it's if, look, if okay. I was running an OS like like Windows where <laughs> no, no, seriously, like like where that is far more of a concern, um, you know, it's far <clears> more <throat> likely that I would have gotten malware then I would probably sacrifice some CPU and disk usage to, uh, you know, to running the real time scanning. I'm I'm not at that point yet. Right. As long as I'm scanning once a week, if I'm not finding anything at all or if I'm finding something once a year, I'm OK. You know, but as soon as it gets to the point where it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah no, I'll, I'll make that trade off. So that that's my logic anyway. So I just want to know, you know, so there you go. Mm. That's the thing is we want to know and we want to learn at least five new things. I hope you have learned your minimum quota of the week of five new things. Did you learn your minimum quota? I did, John. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's how it works. It's, uh, I love it. It's great. I love what we do. Yeah, here. But there's some other things I want to know, Dave. Such I mean, as? I know the email address. Both of them, for, in fact. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Both of them. But there may be some other things about the podcast that. Some people we want to know about. Well, I'm going to tell you what they are, Dave. Okay. Uh, Pick so one. So there's this Twitter thing. And on Twitter, I am John O'Pron. He is Dave Hamilton. The podcast is Mac Gab. The publication is Mac Observer. And that guy who's flying around somewhere. That's Pilot Pete. It's Pilot Pete. All That's on Twitter.com. So check us on that. Every now and then we get some uh, Sweet. good tips and, and interactions with uh, with the Twitters, even though you're only 240 characters, right? Somebody That's right. Know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Double what it started as, so there you go. Or double what it was when we started, I should say, to be more accurate. So. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, well thanks for listening, folks. Uh, make sure to tell all your friends about the show, and I, I don't just say that offhandedly, like that actually, word of mouth or word of the keyboard uh, is one of the biggest and most effective ways that we can grow our audience. So if you like what's going on here, share the show with your friends. It really, really makes a difference. It's a good thing. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for sending in all your questions and your tips and, and everything. It really like it's we're a community here and it's the only way that if we weren't, if it was just me and John, it would literally be just me and John. But it's not. Thank goodness. Right. It's all of us. And you are a huge part of that. So keep doing what you're doing and do more of it. It's awesome. I want to thank Cashfly for uh, providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Of course, I want to thank all of our sponsors in uh, in the episode. We had Jamf, uh, Jamf Now, actually, at jamf.com slash MGG, hairclub.com slash MGG, capterra.com slash MGG, and, of course, in our podcast marketplace, smilesoftware.com slash podcast, otherworld computing at maxsales.com, and barebones software at barebones.com. Thank you so much for listening, folks. Thank you for, well, I I already thanked you for everything. I'm going to give you some lasting advice. And that lasting advice is Mm -hmm. don't get caught. Made up.